So let us next consider um, what techniques are used to measure health. And I preface this within the US and uh, by the USDA and our general medical practices. And uh, there are two main techniques that we use, uh, varying opinions on the uh, currentness of the techniques, but body mass index is sort of the go-to. We don't need to actually measure fat concentration for this or fat percentage for this, lean body mass. That's one of the criticisms of it. We are simply taking kilograms and dividing them by the height in meters squared, and that gives us a body mass index number. Now, if you are doing it in the metric system, it's all simple and easy. You could either choose to convert your mass from uh, imperial to metric and use kilograms and height from inches to meters and use meters, or you could take those figures and multiply them by a factor of 703. Uh, depends which you think is easier uh, to do. But that's a number to keep in mind if you're going to use pounds and inches as a measurement for body mass index. So let's take a body mass index of an individual who is 160 pounds and 67 inches tall uh, using our uh, American system. We multiply our imperial system. We multiply that by a factor of 703. We get the same number whether we use imperial or metric, and that is a body mass index of 25. When we look at that body mass index, there's standard charts. You can find them all over the place. And you'll see that they are broken down into categories of underweight, normal, overweight, and obese. And um, these categories get quite a bit of criticism because obviously we haven't taken into consideration lean body mass versus fat body mass. And when considering athletes, and very muscular people, we may uh, have someone with a body mass index over 25 that is showing up to be either overweight or obese, depending on the numbers, um, that is actually just very physically fit and has a high bone density or high muscle mass. Um, so body mass index does get some criticism, but again, it is the standard. Another measurement or another parameter that we use uh, to give a little bit more credit to or in conjunction with body mass index, obviously we have blood testing and we can see what all the various levels of uh, metabolites and such are, but waist to hip ratio is a quick measure. Uh, you can probably get a good gauge by looking at someone. Uh, as to their waist to hip ratio, but there is a calculation for it. And the point of doing a waist to hip ratio is about differentiating between visceral and subcutaneous fat. So subcutaneous fat, that's the fat that's uh, under our skin. We can feel it, we can pinch it, we can use a caliper test to assess uh, the fat fat mass of someone. However, you cannot measure visceral fat because it's inside and uh, inside the, the peritoneal cavity. And um, all of that fat uh, is natural to have a certain amount of that fat to protect the organs and pad things and uh, create a safe environment for our organs. However, when we have an excess of that fat, it's associated with certain maladies. Now, how do we do a waist to hip ratio? The measurements are taken at one inch above the waist and the narrowest point of the waist and the uh, widest point of the hips. And we take the waist, we divide it by the hips, and there you have your ratio. Ideally, that ratio is one or less. Again, here are some numbers. Uh, they vary from source to source, but in general, it's assumed that optimal numbers are about 0.8 for women, 0.9 for men, because men generally have narrower hips. However, 
Uh, I wouldn't recommend committing them necessarily to memory. I would say that a ratio over one is probably less than optimal. So good numbers to keep in mind, but again, no need to get absolutely specific with that. There uh, are many studies, as I'm sure you're familiar, uh, that uh, indicate that having a high ratio of uh, waist to hip uh, is a chance of developing insulin resistance, uh, type 2 diabetes, and some metabolic syndrome. So uh, you are probably familiar with this waist to hip ratio in terms of the apple versus pear shape. So apple shape is supposed to be an unhealthy shape. Someone with a larger waist and narrower hips has lots more visceral fat inside the uh, body cavities than someone who is pear shaped who has wider hips and a narrower waist, having a much lower ratio. So that's what you need to know about waist to hip ratios. What are some of the consequences of BMI being too high? Uh, these are the ones that we need to be aware of. I'm sure that you're familiar with those, hypertension, diabetes type 2, incidence of stroke increases, incidence of coronary heart disease or artery disease, uh, dyslipidemia. We see variation in HDL and LDL such that the high density or good lipoproteins drop and LDLs increase, the bad lipoproteins, triglycerides increase very low density lipoproteins. All of these are consequences that we need to keep in mind and are uh, certainly responsible for knowing for tests. Sleep apnea definitely can happen and of course cancer. And part of the reason that we're at higher risk for cancer is that it's not only the ovaries that produce estrogen, fat cells also produce a certain amount of estrogen. So if you have an estrogen-dependent cancer develop, then higher levels of fat would increase the levels of estrogen. And uh, there are definitely a lot of studies showing that that leads uh, to higher incidence of cancer. So keep all of these consequences in mind. Again, I'm sure there are ones that are sort of already in the back of your head, uh, but it's nice to put a list together. In fact, on that note, why don't you pause and see what sort of list you can put together. Hide your screen and write down all of the consequences of having too high of a BMI. So now let's consider what it takes to cut the fat. Now we all know that having a higher caloric output than caloric intake is going to uh, have a caloric deficit, but how much does it take to actually cut a pound of fat. When we look at burning a pound of fat, the number that's reported is 3,500 calories. Now that is a pretty standard number and you should commit that one to memory. Uh, it's a standard estimate for the caloric deficit it takes to burn one pound of fat. Now, if you're like me, you probably have gone and calculated it out and thought that one pound of fat equals about 454 grams. And if fat is nine calories per gram, guess what? Uh, the number is bigger than 3,500 calories. Why is that? So you could scratch your head for a while and think about it and probably recognize that uh, fat Body fat is not just made up of purely oil or fat. It is uh, cellular matter too. Those cells, although they have a lot of fat in them, um, are also have organelles. So there's cellular components to subtract from that fat amount. Either way, the bottom line is it is a lot of work for our patients to lose one pound of fat. 3,500 calories in a day when you consider let's say a, an intake of about 2,000 calories a day, which might be high, but say an active person, then we have to uh, have a deficit for one pound of fat of about 500 calories a day. Uh, that's quite a large deficit in order to lose a pound in about a week. So this is just a number that you need to keep in mind so that you can um, 
counsel patients uh, as to how long and make accurate predictions or realistic predictions as to how long it's going to take to lose the poundage. So in short, we've covered uh, very fast snippets of each of the things that you need to know about uh, energy expenditures and uh, values in nutrition. So I look forward to seeing you uh, in future lectures as we explore more on vitamins and such in nutrition.